Hi, my name is Megan Tanaik and I'm working with my partner Danny Shillow, reporting here from Rome Free Academy in Rome, New York. Today we are interviewing Vietnam era veteran Roger Sykes on December 19, 2004. Okay, uh, what did you know about Vietnam before you joined the military and went into the war? Well, not an awful lot, just what I'd seen on TV, and uh, I guess everybody becomes curious after a while as to what it's really about. And, you know, you have a lot of friends that when they serve us during that time period, and they come home and tell you about different things, but you're still uh, curious as to exactly what did take place over there or what it was all about. You just can't imagine you know, what it would be like to be there. And even when I got into service for the first year, Ran into a lot of returning veterans who would tell you about their experiences, but everybody still had a curiosity. That, uh, I'm sure they couldn't uh, relay that information to you accurately about what it was like unless you were there. So I think everybody not necessarily wanted to go, but was still curious as to exactly what it was all about. And that was, I guess, you know, part of you wanted to go and part of you didn't want to go. It's mostly just information that's passed along to people that are there. Well, why did you join, uh, choose to join the Marines and in what year did you do Why did I join the Marines as opposed to any other branch of the military? Or Yes. Well, I always thought the Marine Corps was the uh, best of the branches of service, the most disciplined, the uh, most tradition. I had a lot of friends that had joined the Marine Corps, so I decided that uh, you know, I liked the way they did things, or at least when I how I thought they did things, so I joined them, and I joined in uh, 1966. Um, where did you go to training, and what was it like for you? Well, I went to boot camp, which every new Marine goes to at Paris Island, South Carolina. That's quite famous. And uh, the training there was uh, unbelievably difficult. Everybody that went through it would come home and tell you, oh, <coughs> now, you're not going to know how tough it is. You, I can't explain how tough it is until you get there and you realize that. Everything you heard was uh, understated. It was uh, really difficult. And, uh, in the particular platoon I was in, we had 120 recruits in there who did everything together. They uh, went to class every day together. They did their physical training together. They did the shooting together. They slept in one big room on double racks, and showers, everything. It was a 120 member family that you uh, were with every single day. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What kind of classes did you take while you were in training? Well, they had all kinds of classes like defensive, defensive tactics, uh, military rules and regulations, uh, all firearms, how to break the weapons down, how to clean them, how to fire them, how to repair them. Uh, there were classes on almost everything. Uh, hygiene, uh, a lot of it was on the general orders that each Marine has to know, and just things like that. Um, how did you find out you were going to Vietnam and what were your feelings about? When you get out of boot camp, when everyone graduates from boot camp, they have a set of orders that's given to them and tells them where they're going to go. Some of them may be going to uh, Camp Lejeune, some may go to Camp Pendleton, some may be going to Japan, but on the particular ones that I got, they said then that I was going to be going to the Marine detachment in Vietnam, but before I was to go there, I was supposed to go to Camp Lejeune for some more infantry training. So everybody knew right from boot camp where they were headed. <clears throat> what were my feelings about that? Well, I expected it when I went in there because 1966 is when the war really started to get more heated. Just about everybody, <coughs> excuse me, just about everybody that joined at that time could expect that uh, they were probably going to go there, especially if you were an infantryman, which I was. And I knew my boot camp that I was going to be an infantryman, and most infantrymen are assigned to Vietnam sooner or later. So I expected to go when I joined. Um, how old were you when you were in training, and how old were you when you left here again? I was 19 when I enlisted, and I was 20. Um, how did you feel about your deployment, and what were your friends and family's reactions? Well, again, I had expected to go, but it was delayed a little bit. When I went to Camp Pendleton, I was supposed to go 
within a matter of weeks, but I got uh, put in a different platoon and then temporarily assigned to a different unit, and it took me several months before I was actually deployed. So for a while, I didn't know if I was actually going to be deployed or not, and then when the time came, uh, I still had, to, had expected it at some point. And, uh, I guess the curiosity at that point had got to me, and I really wondered what it was like. I wasn't opposed to going. I wasn't going to volunteer to go by any means, but uh, I think the curiosity and hearing from everybody that came back made every guy feel that he wanted to go so that he could see first day what was what. And my family, they obviously didn't want me to go, but uh, I think uh, they probably already knew from the beginning, too, that the chances were pretty good. Um, what were some of the aspects of unity and conformity taught to young Marines? Oh, well, uniformity was a big deal. Discipline and uniformity in the Marine Corps are two uh, high priorities. And if you've ever seen Marines in a unit, they all look alike, they all dress alike, most of them act alike. Uh, there's a lot of uh, camaraderie between the men because it's kind of, uh, I think most Marines feel like it's a a fraternity, a small fraternity that not everybody can get in. And that makes for a close relationship. And uh, like I say, everybody that has been in the Marine Corps uh, has that certain feeling of closeness and camaraderie. Once a Marine, always a Marine really holds true. Right. Uh, whenever you run into somebody, even today I ran into one of your uh, people out front and when he saw that I was a Marine, he introduced himself. He was a former Marine, and uh, it was just that uh, close-knit bond between the Marines. It's just, I think it's because of the training and uh, the discipline and the, uh, the fact that the Marine Corps is a small, very small, selective uh, unit. Not like the other branches of the military, we're by far the smallest one. Right. Uh, so I think that builds this camaraderie and esprit de corps. Um, or did you spend your last days in the United States before you began? Where did I spend my last days? Here? Yes. Uh, I was at California, Camp Pendleton. Were you with family or? No. Um, what was the general public opinion of the war in your area? Well, uh, I don't think it was too good. Of course, you can't remember the 60s, but I'm sure you've seen films and protests mm -hmm. back in the 60s and even in the 70s. And, you know, it wasn't a popular war. So uh, we weren't real popular either when we came home. But uh, most of the people that went there are the ones that should speak to them. And the, the people that didn't go are, are, sh are the ones that shouldn't be speaking about it because they don't know. So I think you'll find that most of the people that were there uh, believed in what they were doing. And the people that were back here really didn't know. I think they were just opposing the war because it was a war. It didn't matter if we were in Vietnam or if we were uh, in Korea, or uh, if we were in Europe, certain people oppose wars no matter what. I mean, some of them would probably oppose a war if we had to fight one in our own country. So I'd say leave it up to the people who are there to determine whether it was uh, a noble cause or not. Um, did you have any worries or concerns based on what you saw in the news and propaganda? About the protesters? No, no not really. No. We didn't, of course, when you're over there, you know, there is no such thing as the news. There's no TVs or right. radios or anything like that. So uh, you heard through letters what was going on. But it uh, really didn't concern yourself too much because you really didn't uh, uh, see it. You weren't exposed to it until after you got home and then you saw what was going on here. But uh, while you were there, I don't think you really uh, thought about it an awful lot. You just kind of knew that it was taking place. And, wasn't much you could do about it, so you just went about your business. Um, what did uh, Semper Fi mean to you before you went to Vietnam? Well, it means always faithful. So it still meant that before I went, after I went, after I got home, after I got out. Great answer. Um, do you still feel a strong bond with your Marine brothers? Can I hear still what? You feel a strong bond with your Marine brothers? Oh, yeah, for sure. More so than before the war? No, I, th I think if there hadn't been a war, there'd still be that common bond. I, I think it did make you closer to the guys that you served with, for sure. Uh, but as far as being close because you're Marines, you always have that anyway, even in a time of peace. But certainly, the people that you served with, you developed a closer bond with those people.
Um, what makes a marine bond such a unique and special relationship? You said earlier that it was because of small branch, but do you think there's more than that? Yeah, uh, like I said, I think it's the training, how hard it is to get in, how hard it is to stay, just the relationships that you build with people because you're saying you're going through something that not everybody could get through. Uh, just the values that the Marine Corps instills in each of its members is different from any other branch. Uh, I just think their tradition uh, is different than any other branch. I mean, they've been here since 1775, the oldest branch of the service. I just think all those things together make for a, uh, a common bond and a strong bond, and uh, it's kind of a unique organization. So I think all those things together kind of contribute to this. And once you leave there, you still see that uh, guys still have those same beliefs. The things that were important in the service become important after you leave. I don't think any other branch of the service can say that. So not as wholeheartedly or as completely as we do. Um, what kind of special training did you receive in preparation for combat? Well, obviously our boot camp was geared towards the end of uh, going to Vietnam, and not only uh, peacetime, but certainly during the time of war, your, your basic training is going to have uh, a lot of influence on how you conduct yourself over there. Once you left boot camp, you went, if you were an infantryman like I was, you went to Camp Geiger, which was an infantry training regiment. And where was that? That was part of Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. After that, if you were in the infantry, you went to advanced infantry training, which only the people that were going to be in the infantry went to. And from there, you went to California, usually, and that's where your jump off, jump, jump off point was. Normally, you went to Okinawa for another 30 days of training, but Back in 1968, when I went, the, the Tet Offensive was underway and they needed some emergency troops, so they sent us over there directly from California to Vietnam and we didn't get the 30 days additional training in Okinawa. It was kind of on-the-job training after we got there, but uh, it happened so fast, like in 48 hours, we had been given our orders and we were there two days later. Do you think the lack of that 30 day training affected for Polly and no. Because when we went over there, we were teamed up with people that had already been there several months. Your whole unit wasn't fresh there. You went over there as a replacement. You would go into a platoon or a company that had been there for years, and they just backfilled the replacement. So you're going in with experienced people all the time. It wasn't like they were sending 250 brand new green Marines over there. You went into a unit that was, had been there for a long time. Um. Upon arriving in Vietnam, where were you stationed and what was your platoon like? I was in a company, it was called Hotel Company, 2nd Battalion, 27th Marine Regiment. And that was about three miles north of Da Nang. Uh, our responsibilities, for the most part, we, because we were infantry, uh, we would go out to the field for two days, probably in platoon size strength, which would be normally maybe 40 people, but oftentimes it was depleted, so more oftentimes than not, you went out there with probably 20 to 25 uh, Marines. And then when you went out to the field, you would split up into three patrols. And you would patrol uh, during the day, and you'd come back, and one patrol would sit still overnight, and the other two would go out overnight to patrol. <clears throat> and you did that for two days, and then you'd come back, you'd spend one day in the company area, and you'd do the same thing again. You just repeated it one day back, two days out, one day back, two days out. And that's what our responsibility was for the most part. Now on occasion they would send us, maybe there was a bridge that they had to secure to make sure none came and blew it up. Mm -hmm. We would go out there and we would just sit on that bridge for two weeks at a time and then someone would come and replace us and we'd go <coughs> back to the field. Or we would uh, be security on a uh, convoy that had to go north to Fubai might do that for a couple of weeks and then go back to the field. Or they might send you out on an operation where you go out to the field for 26, 27 days in a row and they just take you out by helicopter and they drop you off maybe two or three hundred people then. They would drop you off in a particular area and then they would come back. They would resupply you during that 25 to 30 day period and then at the end of that time 
someone would either come to replace you or they would just come and pick you up and take you back to your uh, battalion area. And were you usually with the same group and your group and you mm -hmm. were all in the same Yes, your, once you got into your uh, company and your platoon and your squad, you were with them every day. You slept with them, you went out in the field with them, you went on an operation, you went with them. If you went to the bridge for security, you went with them. If you went on the convoy, you went with them. So you were with the same people for the most part. Once in a while, someone might get transferred uh, to a different unit, but 99% of the time, you were with the same people every day. <clears throat> what was the general atmosphere like in Vietnam? Did you everybody get along or was it more of a tense situation because of the war? No, I think everyone got along relatively well. But like any group, you get right. 30 or 40 people together, there's going to be personality conflict. <coughs> some people you're going to like better than others. So there was some friction there. I'm not going to say there wasn't, but all things considered, it wouldn't have been any different if we'd have been here as part of a, uh, a baseball team. And I'm sure the major league teams have the same situation. They have 25 players. I'm sure within those 25, there are people that, that don't get along real well with every single member. It's no different. Um, are there any special operations or missions you'd like to talk about? <clears throat> well, there weren't any real special operations that we went on other than this one called Allenbrook, which we went out for 26 days, which was a little unusual because when you go out, it means 26 days without a shower, without a shave, without a change of socks. Sometimes it's difficult to get your food brought in because they bring it in by helicopter. So just because of the long duration, it was unusual. And 26 days is a long time. Sleeping outside every night, uh, no shelter, and, uh, really no protection. So that was unusual only because 26 days is a long time to go just out into the, the bush or into the field. What was your mission? Well, I, you know, we were just kind of, we were called the grunts. Nobody explained to us what our mission was, per se. The, the officers obviously knew, but they're not going to take the time to explain the mission to every single one. So they would just uh, tell you what you were going to be doing, uh, tell you what time you were going to be leaving, basically where you were going to go. You were going to be looking, obviously, for the enemy out there because this was a stronghold that they felt that uh, they were located in. But uh, they didn't explain much more than that. You knew that the reason you're going over here is because they think that's a stronghold of the enemy and they want them uh, removed from that area. So, but to think that they're going to come and explain every mission in detail to every guy is. Uh, just not going to happen. I wasn't right. expected. Um, you mentioned in your New York State individual record of officers and enlisted personnel um, the differences in warfare that the Vietnam War introduced to the world. Can you tell us about the experiences you had um, have had with this new type of warfare versus the type of warfare in World War II? Well, it was uh, it was not a conventional war. If you look at any of the films of the history of World War II, it was. Uh, Great armies fighting, great navies fighting. There was a, a line where we knew this was you know, the area that we held. The enemy held a particular area. Uh, the war was fought mostly uh, with men, but there were so many more uh, <coughs> additional ingredients with the airstrikes and the tanks and the ships and. Uh, it was just a conventional type of war where uh, they were on one side of the line, we were on the other, and uh, like I say, the armies battled it out. In Vietnam, it wasn't like that. Really, the only secure area that you could say was secure was the spot that you were standing on at the particular time. It was secure while you were there, but as soon as you moved on, it was no longer secure. The battalion areas where you stayed when you were back in from the field was secure, and it was secured by fences and minefields. But uh, there was no secure area, there was no uh, <clears throat> so-called line drawn in the sand to say this is where we are, this is where the bad guys are, no such thing. And you're, and you're fighting a guerrilla type war where the people aren't identified, they're not wearing uniforms. Uh, during the daytime they could be uh, friendly towards you. Uh, you know, if you walk through their village, they might come out and try to interact with you somehow. And at night they could be out there uh, laying booby traps and. Uh, firing weapons at you, so you really couldn't identify the weapon where World War II 
almost every person was in uniform, and you knew, you know, you knew the Germans, the Italians, the Americans, and it was easy to, to distinguish the enemy. In Vietnam, there, there was no enemy per se, except for the North Vietnamese, who were uniformed people, but most of the uh, incidents that we got involved with were with South Vietnamese guerrillas who dressed just like everybody else did in the country. It would be like looking around the United States now and by only looking at a person determine uh, whether he was English, Irish, German, it would be impossible and it was impossible over there to determine who the enemy was because they were all Vietnamese. Some were our friends, some were our enemies, and a lot of them just didn't care. I'm sure they weren't supportive of the war because we were changing their lifestyle and destroying their country. So I'm sure a lot of them were sympathetic to their own people more so than they would be to the Americans who were in their country. Obviously that would put you on, make you be on guard during the daytime with the different um, South Vietnamese people. How did you protect yourself against the Viet Cong? During the daytime, uh, it wasn't as dangerous. Nighttime was when it was dangerous because that's when they would come out and, and you know, they would kind of hit and run, hit and run, hit and run. They always picked a time and a place when it was to their advantage. If, if we outnumbered them or it was daytime where we could see or we had a clear view or visibility, they weren't going to engage because we had superior firepower and we could overpower them. But their uh, way of attack was booby traps, hit and run, nighttime attacks, mortars, things like that. They wouldn't really want to take us on head on because we had we could call in airstrikes, we could call in artillery, plus our own weapons that we carried, our handheld weapons were superior to what they had for the most part. But uh, <clears throat> It was, uh, it was much more dangerous at night. Uh, the daytime, the, the thing you had to worry about in the daytime was booby traps more than anything. I can't remember too many instances uh, where we got into a big conflict during the daylight hours. Although when you did, it was substantial because they picked the time and the place and they weren't going to take you out unless they thought they could uh, win. So if you did get in a daytime battle, it was usually a pretty good one. Um, what kind of booby traps and what kind of things did they pick on set? Well, they used everything that we had against us. If we dropped a grenade off our belt, they would take it and use it for a booby trap. If we fired a mortar around and it didn't explode, they would find it and use it for a booby trap. Uh, we had weapons that were called a light anti-tank weapon. It was a fiberglass tube. We fired it once and then it discarded it. If they got a hold of that, they would use that maybe to fire one mortar around themselves. But uh, they took advantage of everything we had, uh, everything that we dropped. See rations, they might booby trap mm -hmm. them and wait for the next person to come along and try and pick it up. But uh, they were masters at, uh, at booby traps, and, and not only through the ordinance that they got on their own, but just the many items that we left behind or lost or dropped. And, uh, they were experts at it. Um, what was your personal opinion of the battle tactics that either side used? And um, do you believe that they're effective and necessary? Which tactics? Um, any of the battle tactics, like there were the stories about um, melee, obviously, and then some of the other things that your troop in particular used. Well, when you talk about melee, are you talking about the uh, people that were murdered there? No, about going in and storming the villages. And were you involved in any of that? Or are you talking about in Vietnam or outside? In Vietnam. Well, uh, we didn't storm any villages per se. Uh, like I said before, our normal procedures were we would go out to the field for two days and we would come back for one. And when we went out, we had a map. And they told us that during this two-day period, you would check these ten different spots. That took us through villages. But most of the time, we just walked through them. The villagers were there. They would just watch you pass on by. There weren't too many conflicts with uh, villages. Now, if you're talking about villages that were burned down, is that what you meant? Yeah. There were occasions where if you were patrolling in an area and you took fire from a village, that you might go in there and assault that village. And sometimes it required that you, you know, eliminate that village because uh, oftentimes it was the same village over and over again. That whenever you came into that vicinity, you took on enemy fire. It was obvious that it was coming from that village. And 
uh, probably the best way to protect yourself is to eliminate that village or uh, make that area more secure by removing those hooches or, or whatever it was there. It didn't mean that you went in there and killed all the civilians, right. for sure. It was more eliminating the buildings where you were taking this fire from. Plus, you were pretty well assured that if you were getting fire from a particular village, that those villagers were sympathetic to the enemy. So you really didn't have too many second thoughts about going in and removing that village and making those people move elsewhere. Uh, but no unit that I was ever in was ever involved in just going in and massacring a village or uh, just for no reason. Right. You know, I've heard stories how, oh, uh, the military went in and shot all their animals and did this. I never saw anything like that happen. I'm sure on occasion that did happen over there. None of the units that I was ever in involved themselves in that. But you have to also look at the frustration that builds on these people for months and months and months when somebody's trying to kill them. Uh, they reach a boiling point and sometimes they overreact and those things I'm sure did occur. But it wasn't just uh, for the pleasure of going and uh, shooting some of these animals or burning down their uh, village. It was because they probably had taken on fire for months and months and months. They'd probably taken a lot of casualties. Probably a lot of it was overreaction, but until you're there, uh, I don't think you could imagine what uh, feelings build up in you right. and, and lead to those kinds of things. But uh, I only can speak for the units that I was with, and I think I can speak for most of the Marine units over there. That, uh, that thing didn't happen on a regular basis. Uh, it was in the course of business, so I'm sure a lot of civilians didn't like it anymore, uh, were injured or killed. But it wasn't an intentional act. Uh, it's just it's going to happen in, in a time of war, especially in a war like this where you can't tell people uh, move out of a, a particular area because that's going to be a combat zone. In World War II, yeah, you probably could tell a particular city, tell the civilians, look, at, we want you to you know, remove yourselves from a particular city in uh, Germany or France because the American army is going to be coming through there in a week, and it gives those people an opportunity to leave. This was different. You didn't have a secure place, and there wasn't an area that was considered safe and secure. It was the, uh, the piece of ground that you were standing on was secure, and that was it. So you didn't have the opportunity to always make sure that civilians were removed uh, from a particular area. And oftentimes, you never saw the enemy. Uh, if you take fire from a tree line or a village, <coughs> they don't expose themselves. Right. Most of them are dug in, they're well camouflaged. Uh, and you very seldom would even see the enemy. You, you take on the fire, you receive the mortar rounds, you receive the rockets, small arms fire, you would very seldom see the enemy. And you would fire back in the direction of the, of the fire, and sometimes you would fire into an area where there were civilians. And were there any instances that you did see the enemy? Occasionally you would, but uh, like I say, their <coughs> type of attacks were more hit and miss. I mean, they, unless you were over there, some of these pictures really don't pick how the countryside looked. If you look through there, you'll see that a lot of it was very flat terrain, and it seemed to be either one or the other, mountainous or very, very, very flat. Uh, there were tree lines almost everywhere you looked. You, you walk for 50 yards, you'd come to a tree line. You'd get past that tree line, you'd walk to the next one. There were not really uh, an awful lot of open areas where you had three or 400 yards of clear vision. Around your battalion area, they came in and they cleared out a lot of the underbrush so that you would have a clear field of fire and you could protect yourself and see somebody that was approaching. But when you were out in the field, uh, you probably couldn't see more than 50 or 60 yards in any one direction at any time. And it was constant where uh, they'd fire a few rounds, maybe fire some orders at you, and then they'd disappear. Uh, you very seldom saw them. They always tried to carry their dead away because they didn't want you to believe that you'd uh, ever you know, killed one of the enemy. Uh, but occasionally we did you know, recover bodies and uh, did see the enemy, but very seldom. Um, you said that your officers were very young but very professional. Did you develop any personal friendships or relationships with these men? Uh, not with the officers. When I say officers, I mean commissioned officers, people who held the rank of uh, second lieutenant or above. Mm -hmm really didn't develop a close friendship with them because uh, they were in a different position. It's, it wasn't really uh, a normal thing for commissioned officers and enlisted people to be uh, close.
close-knit or socialize or things like that. So you developed a close-knit group among the enlisted men. But the officers pretty much stayed to themselves, and there weren't very many of them. When we went out in a, a platoon-size uh, detail, we would only have one second lieutenant with us. That he, he was there to, to give the orders and tell you where you were going to go, what you were going to do. But uh, you didn't really develop a close relationship with them only because uh, they were commissioned officers and they kind of uh, kept their distance. How did the officers help you prepare for your operations? You said you only had one second lieutenant, so it was it mostly enlisted men that were preparing you? On our day-to-day -day patrols, we would have a lieutenant that went out. That was in a platoon size uh, endeavor. But when we went out in company strength, the company commander would be there, who was the captain. And if you went out on an operation, like I talked about earlier, Operation Allenbrook, where you had a couple of hundred Marines out there, you were going to have, you know, you're going to have your lieutenants are going to be there with every uh, uh, platoon. The company commander is going to be there with every company. You're probably going to have a major or two out there to oversee the whole operation. You might have a lieutenant colonel there too. So the bigger the operation, the more commissioned officers would be assigned to it. But the daily routine of going out for two days and coming back for, for one, we would have just one lieutenant with us. And, and it wasn't a matter of preparing. I mean, they would give you as much information as they had. Uh, but we knew from our own experiences where the danger areas were. You might go out for two or three weeks in a row into a particular area, if that was your same area, that you knew was going to be secure and you weren't going to have any problems. After a month, when you switch locations and go elsewhere, you might know that as a place where you frequently have problems and you prepared yourself. You know, just in the next two or three weeks, we're going to have problems out here because this area is always uh, uh, inhabited by the enemy. We're going to take mortars, we're going to take small arms fire, but you expected it. And they would try to give as much information as they had about what to expect when you got there. But you knew mostly from your past experiences because you moved around constantly so that the same platoon or the same company wouldn't be over in the most active area. You, know, you want to spread it around so that every company took on that troublesome spot sooner or later. And then you got a chance to kind of relax for two or three weeks when you take on a different area that's more secure and uh, uh, friendlier. Um, you received several medals and awards, including the National Defense Medal and the Presidential, Presidential Unit Citation. Can you tell us about the circumstances in which you were awarded these honors? Well, the National Defense Medal is given to every active unit, so that's not one that's a personal uh, medal, and it's not one that most people would uh, recognize as something special. Everyone got that. And you don't feel that as a special honor? Well, well it is. Ex I don't take it as a personal uh, medal, because everyone that's in active duty gets that. So you really don't have to do anything special to get that. So of all the awards that active members get, I think they say the same thing, that that one is uh, not as highly thought of as some of the other ones. The, unit, the presidential unit citation, yeah, that was a good one because not every unit got that. They took a look at what your outfit did and if they thought you were worthy. The entire unit got it, which was very good to get that, obviously, but again, it wasn't a personal decoration. I think the ones that individuals respect the most. Obviously the Congressional Medal of Honor is the top one. Silver Star is a personal. Bronze Star is personal. <coughs> Purple Heart is personal. Uh, the Navy Cross, things like that, which are awarded to a particular individual, I think are the ones that are high, held in highest regard. Uh, again, the National Defense Medal, I'm sure everyone's proud that they serve, but that one was one that was pretty much uniform. And if you were in the Navy, 50 miles out at sea, you got it. And if you were a, a, a Marine infantryman who saw combat every day of the year, you got the same medal. So uh, it was kind of across the board. And uh, I'm sure every person appreciates it. It just wasn't a personal uh, recognition. Um, on May 1st, 19, or I'm sorry, May 5th, 1968, you were wounded in action. Was this the reason you were awarded the Purple Heart almost short? Can you elaborate on your wound and the situation in which you received it? Uh, May 5th, 1968, I had some pictures there of our company area. Uh, 
we were, this was when I was still engaged in the two days out, the one day back, the two days out, one day back. This was our day back in, so we were back in our company area, which was a battalion size uh, camp. And we slept in what were called hooches. It was a wood floor, wood framed tent. Uh, it usually slept, maybe 12 men would sleep in there on cots. Each guy would have his own cot, his own sea bag, and his own personal items, his shaving gear, and things like that. Uh, and then these <coughs> hooches would be lined up, one beside the other. Uh, in our company area, I think we had probably nine or ten of them. I think eleven. In between the hooches, there was a bunker gun. It was a dugout with a roof on it covered with sandbags. So that if something did happen, you could run out of your hooch, get down in the bunker, and be protected. On this particular night, the mortars came in before we had any warning. So uh, the first few hit right in our company area, a lot of guys got shrapnel from the mortars, which I did. But we were still able to get down into these bunkers and protect ourselves from more hits. But uh, it was from shrapnel from a mortar. In the middle of the night, probably, I think it was about 2 o'clock, we had forewarning that something might happen because a lot of different areas were getting hit that night. But <clears throat> Before anybody came back to say, you know, get the bunkers, the mortars were there. So everybody just got up and started running, and got down in the bunkers, and stayed there until the building. Um, once you received your medal, where did you display it? Did you wear it on your uniform to pride, or did you display it somewhere in your house? Well, actually, you don't display these on your uniform. The you don't? Time, no. <clears throat> the only time you would display a medal on your uniform is if you were in your dress blues for a special ceremony. And even today, you see the people with their medals on their uniform. Normally, your medals aren't displayed uh, on a uniform. What they do give you is something similar to this. It's called a ribbon. And this one has one here. This is what you would wear on your uniform to signify that you had a Purple Heart. And every medal had a corresponding ribbon. And when you see military people now, uh, if you look on their uniforms, not on their work utilities, which are their green or camouflaged daily uh, work clothes, but when you see them in a regular uniform, most of them will wear their ribbons. And you see the higher the rank or the longer uh, period of service, it's called fruit salad. And uh, each one of those represents a medal or decoration that that particular person received. And if you see, a, well, let's say a, a major or a colonel or a general, they're going to have a lot more medals and uh, ribbons because they've been in the service longer, they've held more positions. Normally, a PFC might have just one sometimes because he's got the National Defense Ribbon. He's never going outside the country. But uh, each ribbon represented a, a medal that they had received. So if a person had six ribbons, he had six medals. But it doesn't necessarily mean that all six were personal decorations. Probably they weren't. But, uh, some of them were unit citations, National Defense, good conduct medal. If you have more than three years and didn't get in any substantial trouble, you got a good conduct medal. So. You have to look at them individually to really tell uh, what status they have. Right. Um, <clears throat> once you return to the States, how are you treated by the, the citizens and did you experience any of the protesting after the war? Well, I came from a small village, uh, so really protests weren't an option there. I'm sure uh, you know, people that went back to New York City or to a, a larger city like maybe Syracuse or Buffalo, I'm sure they saw protesters. We didn't have that. Most of the rural areas, I think you'll find that people are a little more conservative and a little bit more uh, tolerant of that particular war and a little more supportive of it. I never had anybody uh, say anything to me uh, in, in this village that I grew up in. Uh, nobody ever you know, criticized me or said that the, the war was wrong. I saw it on TV and uh, on the news. But when you come from a small village like that, people know you personally. I don't think you're going to catch any of those kinds of comments. These protesters aren't pro protesting an individual person. They were just protesting the war in general. And, uh, they really couldn't take it personally. Although it did bother everyone, for sure. But uh, you just kind of had to you know, just go about your business. Uh, it was different. Uh, nobody uh, was there to meet you when you came home. There weren't any parades. There weren't any uh, groups there to say, hey, welcome home. It was different. Was there any kind of positive reaction to your turn? Mm, not really. No. I mean, your family obviously was glad to have you home, and you were glad to be home, but really, there wasn't, uh, 
anybody there to pat you on the back or say good job or anything like that. It's just a different, different scenario. And now I watch on TV almost every night of a different unit that comes home to, to uh, Fort Drum or to you know, Fort Dix. And there's always a big uh, group there to meet them, family and friends and media. That didn't go on. Most of it. Um, what was your life like after the service? I went. I came right back home and went right back to work where I'd worked uh, before I went in the service. So it didn't change for me at all. Uh, uh, within, I think when I got home, I was back to work within uh, two weeks. So it really didn't uh, didn't change much. I went back to the old routine. I had the same friends, family. So, uh, not much changed as far as I was concerned, as far as uh, you know, life back here in the States. It was, it was pretty much the same as when I left. And when did you become a police officer? Well, I got back home in 1968 and I was appointed to the state police in 1974. Uh, so I had uh, six years in between where I went back to work uh, for the company that I worked for before I went in service. And then when I had an opportunity to take the state police exam, I took it. And, I was fortunate enough to get hired, which the military helped because at that time, back in the mid-70s, uh, a majority of the people trying to get on the state police were veterans, and they gave us a five-point veterans preference if we had served in, in the military during the time of conflict. So it did help us taking the exam to get in the, in the state police, and most of the people that were in my academy class with 150, uh, probably 100. 100 or 110 of our veterans, so it did help help us get our jobs. So, it was, uh, so that was one way they did take care of us. You know, that was something the federal government did and still does, and give people a veterans preference if they serve in a time of uh, conflict. Um, did you have any participation in reunions, the VFW or the Vietnam Veterans Association? What were the first ones you mentioned? Um, the VFW or any participation in reunions? No. No. Uh, American Legion posts are prevalent throughout. Uh, I was a member of the Riskney Falls Legion for two or three years, but uh, not really an active member. The same with the VFW. I, I know of them. I know they do a lot of good work, but I never uh, joined the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And, uh, haven't had any reunions either. Some people kept contact with their unit, especially if they went over there as a unit and returned as a unit. But that was very unusual. It was a lot easier to do if you did travel as a group. With us, we came as an individual, we left as an individual, and it was hard to keep track of people that served with you because they might have left six months before you did or vice versa. Uh, I did look up a couple of guys. The one was down in Florida, I visited with him. Uh, there's another one that lives up in uh, Bellevue. I keep in contact with him occasionally and one over in Sequoia, but uh, kind of lost track of the rest of them only because we didn't have the opportunity to sit down and say, look, let's make up the names and the addresses, and when we get out of here, we'll get together. Didn't think about doing that. Uh, I'm sure there are ways with the internet now that if somebody really wanted to put their mind to it, they probably could locate most of the uh, people in a particular unit, but you got to find somebody that's willing to take on that task. I did have one guy get a hold of me about four or five years ago on the internet found my name and we traversed the call back and forth who was from Georgia. But uh, really, other than that, no reunions, but I know a lot of units that do have them. Obviously, if somebody put it together, it's something I would uh, certainly go to. Um, did your military service affect the rest of your life? I don't know if it has or not. You know, like I say, when I came back, I went right back into the same routine. I know a lot of times, especially the Vietnam veterans, whenever we talk about Vietnam era veterans, people have a particular you know, feeling or vision of them. And the vision that I get is because most of the Vietnam veterans that I've seen are marching in a parade of protest with long hair and uh, you know, they, they haven't been able to hold down a job. And uh, I think a lot of people think that that's what the norm is for Vietnam veterans when it, it isn't. Uh, the people that do that uh, are the ones that get the publicity. They probably make up 1% or less of all the Vietnam veterans. The veterans like myself, who come back and go about their business, are never heard of again. Nobody knows you're a veteran. And uh, therefore, I don't think that they realize that 
you know, probably 99.9 percent .9 of the people that served in the Marine Corps in Vietnam came back here. We went back into normal life and uh, never skipped a beat. But it's the, the kind of like the uh, the squeaking wheel gets the grease, and these people go down and march in Washington D.C. Uh, you know, tell people about the hard times they've had, and I'm not saying that some of them have, haven't had hard times, but they project themselves as representing all of us, and they right. don't. So that does upset me because I think it, it projects a certain image of the Vietnam veteran that isn't accurate. Like I say, most of the Vietnam Arab veterans are successful people, normal everyday people. You wouldn't know that they were veterans to look at them. But I guarantee if you see a protest and a group of them are claimed to be Vietnam Arab veterans, if the truth are known, probably a lot of them never even served in Vietnam or, or were in the military but never went to Vietnam. Or some of them probably weren't even in the military, but they like to present themselves because they want to make a statement. But I think you'll find that most of the veterans are normal, everyday people, teachers, policemen, doctors, lawyers, politicians, are successful. And, and like I say, I'm sure there are cases where people have come back and they've had problems getting a job or holding it down, they've had personal problems in their life, some of it attributed to the war. But uh, by and large, I think most of the Vietnam Air veterans are decent, law abiding people that have just have gone back into society and, you know, and resumed a normal life. Um, what advice would you give to the young Americans being sent to Iraq today? What would I say to them? Well, I don't know if you'd say anything. I think for the most part, it's like I said earlier, they believe in what we're doing. You know, I'm sure there are some that don't want to go because it's dangerous over there. They don't want to get killed or wounded. But, you know, the military has a job to do, too. And, you, know, you can't really join the military and then say, well, geez, I didn't really count on going to Iraq or I didn't really plan on going to Afghanistan. That's kind of the risk you take when you join the military. And right. after 9-1-1, of course, the military was a popular thing to be. Same with the police and the firemen. So a lot of people joined and, you know, because they were patriotic and, they want to serve. And I don't think you'll find too many of them that don't believe in the war, especially if you talk to the ones that have already been there and come back. I think you'll find it might be a little apprehension among the people that haven't been there in the military. But of those that have already served and come back, I think you'll find that they're in support at almost 100%. Now, there are some reservists I know that are not happy about being sent over there that when they join the reserves, you know, they never think about, geez, someday there might be a war, I might be called upon to go. Right. And they've got to pick up, leave their family, their job, and everything else. I think it's a little bit more uh, unattractive to them than it is the active members of the military. But, on the other hand, the reserves have also provided them with pretty good benefits and pay and an opportunity for a second income and a second retirement. So, my feeling is it kind of comes to the territory. If you want to join the reserves, you have to join knowing the time might come when they call upon you and you're just going to have to go. And it's not something that you can vote on and say, oh, geez, you know, most of us don't want to go. But you join the military and you do what you're told to do. Right. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? No, I think that just about covers it. Uh, I don't have enough of an offer. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Good. You're welcome. Um, would you like to talk to the class? Well, if you got a small class, I would. I, you know. It's, uh, I'd say, 15 people. Well, okay. Not, it could be me, and Danny's not here today. Okay. Um, if you want, uh, you know, I'll just.